So welcome to OV Studios, Justin. Good to have you here. Um, obviously, we've known each other for some time. Um, so what I want to do is to talk through Boson today. Obviously, there's a lot of hype. I'm sure both of us would think right, rightfully so. But for those kind of looking from the outside in as to Boson, the project, the traction, momentum and hype that's been having over the last several months, um, it's difficult to understand you know, what's behind it, um, what's driving its momentum, and how it's gonna deliver on its promise. So today we wanna try to kind of unpack that for everybody. Um, so I think before we go into Boson, it's important to contextualize Boson um, and to think about it in the context of the current web. And obviously it's an antithesis to web platforms, platform monopolies that have kind of dominated um, the last decade plus of the web. The best example in the context of e-commerce is obviously Amazon. Uh, the reality is though, and you and I will openly admit this, we enjoy the benefits of things like Amazon Prime. We have too many Alexas in too many rooms around our home. So it's undeniable that everybody's benefited from platform monopolies, the efficiency gains that we get. Um, the final mile capabilities and, and all this good stuff. But at the same time, I think there's a spectrum of understanding about what's wrong or broken with the platform model. Perhaps why, if you follow it to its end conclusion, it's dystopic. So from your perspective, what's the problem? Why, why do we need e-commerce? So the, the benefits of e-commerce and, and digital technologies are, are clear, and you outlined some of them: um, the convenience, um, the, 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 the sort of instant delivery, the choice, etc. Um, however, what we're also finding is that, that that some of the promise of, for example, a sharing econo economy, of removing uh, friction and and cost from from the system, aren't being um, aren't being delivered, and part of that is due to the to the, to the sort of market structure of having uh, an, an intermediary between a buyer and a seller who can exercise control and market power. Um, and, and what we're seeing is that, that the economies of scale and scope, which companies such as Amazon accrue, mean that over time they are creating um, a, a playing field where other firms can't compete um, and where you know that increasingly they are, they are able to extract more and more from consumers, from firms, and and distort the market. Yeah. So obviously, you know, monopolies monopolize, and so it could be argued Amazon as a corporation is just doing what any good corporation would do. It's maximizing profits. It's trying to acquire as much market share as possible. So. You know, what, why should it be any different? And, you know, what do you think has been the role of regulators in this? Why haven't regulators stopped or contained this? And I guess, you know, why is a digital monopoly worse than any other monopoly? Governments are, and regulators are failing to contain the threat of, of complete monopolization and complete domination. And that, that trajectory leads to essentially a, a kind of global extraction farm where consumers, um, other businesses um, are, are all um, in a position where there is no competition um, and where value, excessive value is extracted. So if we think about like what is a digital monopoly, digital platform monopoly, it's not just a monopoly of transaction, right? There's also a data component mm. There's other components to that that are perhaps more pernicious than just um, having a monopoly on a particular form of good, right? Can you maybe talk through why, why the, those elements are equally, if not more, concerning from a monopolistic sure. perspective? Sure. So I mean, if you take um, an e-commerce platform, for, it, for example, there, there are a number of core um, activities that they that they perform. So one is the coordination of buying and selling, the exchange of sort of digital value for a physical item. 
Um, so this, this, this coordination function. But then as you, as you highlighted, there's also this increasingly this data function. Um, and, and being able to collect data on buyers, sellers, their preferences, transaction data, et cetera, is, is a, a powerful and unassailable tool to developing more products, to being, being able to capture more market share and extract more value. And what we're seeing then is this monopolization of both the coordination function and the data function, which is, you know, which means that other firms just can't compete. And so we, we, we just see this sort of black hole towards a single organization controlling what should be an, an entire ecosystem. And I guess that compounds as well, right? Because very quickly that becomes a data monopoly ultimately is an AI monopoly, and that then allows the system to better optimize, to make better decisions, um, and that advantage is very difficult to catch up. So even if you could break up Amazon, it's already enjoyed the, the data advantage. It's allowed its systems to be better trained, um, and its AI to effectively be more effective. And, and so I, I don't know if you've kind of got some thinking around that element as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's multiple nested feedback loops of, you know, economies of scale, economies of scope, then these economies of insight from the data, and then the, the, these kind of economies of, you know, of intelligence as well. All of which, as, as you said, compound towards this sort of, you know, singularity almost of just complete control of a, of, of a market. Right, so what's the alternative then? So you've got, on the one hand, platform monopolies. Most people will experience them, whether they fully understand the business model or not. But the, this is the web as it is today, the e-commerce businesses that we uh, engage with. What's the alternative? So if we look firstly at what a, what a platform is, I mean, essentially a, a digital platform is a, is, is enables a, a consumer and a producer to come together with a, an interaction um, facilitated by an intermediary. Um, and so in order to, you know, platforms were hugely disruptive to the, to the previous business models. Um, and that's why we've seen such a huge rise in them. But there are also business models or design patterns that disrupt platforms. And I think, you know, we, we, we what we are starting to see is the rise of these tokenized ecosystems. So if you look at, at DeFi, um, we have an, an ecosystem of, of, of tokenized kind of protocols and applications all working together in, in, in to create this sort of liquid digital marketplace. Um, and likewise, Boson Protocol, leveraging DeFi infrastructure and, and technology uh, creates a, a liquid digital marketplace for things. So um, it's similar to, for example, the the liquid sort of global market um, for commodities. So you can buy, you can trade cocoa futures or pork belly, you know, in in Beijing or Chicago, um, and these the these real world things flow across a, a, this global um, digital marketplace. Boson Protocol enables that for any thing, product, service. So the kind of the status quo are platform monopolies, as you said. These are kind of e-commerce platforms, which everybody knows and interacts. They might not fully understand it. So what's the alternative to a, a platform? So you know, if we if we look at what a platform is, essentially a platform is. Um, a, a, a closed envi digital environment where a centralized intermediary will bring together a, produ a producer and a consumer and manage some sort of interaction or transaction between them. And you could liken you know, a, a, a platform to a, a centralized economy. Um, however, in the same way that platforms disrupt, disrupted the previous sort of business models or design patterns, uh, platforms themselves can be disrupted and we've seen that the centralized economies get disrupted by market economies. And likewise, um, centralized platforms can be disrupted by open markets, um, tokenized ecosystems, in fact. So when you talk about tokens, most people will just think about that in the context of these 
speculative assets in, in crypto. But actually, for you, a tokenized network is important. It's an important innovation because they are incentive or disincentive mechanisms, right? They can allow for you to program behaviors into systems. So could you just talk us through that conceptually and why that makes a network that much more powerful compared to a platform? Sure. So the key with, 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 with tokenized networks, in fact, to tokens uh, are a, a generalized term and, and um, you, you, tokens can impact networks in, in a number of ways. So firstly, within platforms or network effects business models, there are some pretty fundamental challenges. One is the, the whole bootstrapping problem of how do I get buyers to join a network with no sellers, sellers to join a network with no buyers. So um, tokens give a very powerful way of incentivizing early, early users to provide this financial utility um, in, in advance of network utility. So it's, it's a, a way of really turbocharging um, network effects business models, personally. Um, secondly, tokens, certain types of tokens, for example, NFTs, can be programmed uh, with, for example, game theory, or you know, you could think of this as just a set of rules um, that will cause behaviors within or, or incentivize behaviors between participants. So this, this combination of, of, of incentives and then encoding game theory is, is very powerful um, in changing the properties of, of, of these um, networks. So I know you think of e-commerce as an innovation system and you take a lot of inspiration and look to leverage innovations and technologies infrastructure from e-commerce. And I know we kind of share this feeling that DeFi is incredibly powerful because it's competition max if you compare it to the existing financial system. So could you talk us through how e-commerce is similar to DeFi and why it will enable kind of greater levels of innovation and competition? Sure. I see that the different systems for innovation as a, it's a bit like having a, well, banking, for example, is a bit like having a fortress. You put all of your expenditure and energy on the castle walls to protect com competitors from coming in. Um, and there's very little in incentive to then innovate you know, inside those castle walls. Um, in contrast, DeFi is that the castle walls have been breached and there are people marauding everywhere and lots and lots of combat and competition and this, this drives this kind of innovation. Um, and the same could be said of um, e-commerce where we are creating monopolies that, yes, will innovate to, to, to support their market position, um, but not that fundamental innovation all across the, 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 the value chain and this kind of creative destruction, if you like. Whereas within, within e-commerce, the system that we, are, we seek to set up is one that, in, in, in a similar way to DeFi, will there, there will be this kind of competition max across the entire uh, value chain of, 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 of separate um, projects working on each area um, to optimize. So how does Boson Protocol enable e-commerce? I know you have a primitive and ecosystem play. So at, at the heart of, of Boson Protocol, there are a number of these, these core primitives. Um, and so firstly, there is the, the coordination of the, of, the, of the exchange between a, a buyer and a seller. So a buyer exchanging digital value for, um, for a physical uh, product or, or service. Um, this, this primitive is, is handled by a piece of game theory that's actually encoded within, within an NFT, within what we call a commitment token. So um, a buyer will place a deposit, a seller will place a deposit, and a buyer will play a, 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 a place a payment amount into um, an escrow, which is then managed by, by this sequential game. And so what, what that does is automates away a lot of the kind of the cost and friction of having a human arbitrator, um, and also eliminates the need for a centralized intermediary. So those commitment tokens are, are, are one, one primitive. Another primitive 
are Thing tokens. So Thing tokens are ERC20 tokens that represent a particular type of Thing product service. So for example, we could have an ERC20 token that's minted for a particular green bicycle, let's say. Um, and I can buy that ERC20 token either directly at a fixed price, but perhaps I buy that ERC20 token from a balancer pool with a, with a bonding curve, giving us all sorts of, you know, kind of um, DeFi and financial poss possibilities. But essentially, I, I, I buy this thing token, and that can then flow across the whole of DeFi. It can find itself in a collateral pool. It can find itself being, you know, with some sort of synthetic product built on top of it. Um, but then eventually that thing token is, is the thing that can then be used to buy the NFT. So you, you plug that th thing token into the NFT and, and commitment token, and then that commitment token handles, using game theory, the exchange of digital value for a physical thing between a buyer and a seller. So you alluded to the idea that once you have a commitment token and you have a thing token, these become collateral in DeFi. And so you can begin to then leverage all the things that happen in DeFi today, but then things that are also in development, right? So uh, you could have something that is uh, a derivative. You could have something that is, um, you know, people speculating on the fulfillment of a particular thing. You can have new forms of credit and insurance. Can you talk us through um, perhaps in, you know, the near to midterm, some of the things that in DeFi that you think could be leveraged in the context of e-commerce? Sure. Um, well, a, a really basic one is just, just forward orders. So um, as a restaurant, I could sell my tables and meals for the next year in advance. Um, and then they could be secondary traded or they could be bundled or, or you, know, um, you know, so that's, that's, that's a pretty basic one. Um, but also, let's say you and I, Jamie, decided that we were going to, we had an idea to create some sort of anti-gravity hoverboard, which is the sort of thing we, we might come up with. Good. Um, and we said, okay, well, let's raise, let's raise some money for that. Then what we could do is we could, we, we could mint a thing token for our anti-grav hoverboard, and we could put that into a, a balancer pool, and we could create an, an initial product offering in advance of actually building um, and building that that hoverboard, um, and so what we have is is just straight out of the box a decentralized Kickstarter. So these are just you know, a couple of the examples of what happens when you leverage De DeFi with Boson as a bridge to financialize um, real world assets. And so I want to kind of circle back to the core primitive again because um, I think it's important for people to realize why why e-commerce is now possible as a consequence of Boson. So of course, a lot of innovation is gonna come in the e-commerce stack from organizations and people beyond the Boson team. But this kind of exchange mechanism is the core primitive, right? Because without that, it's like the cornerstone to what's possible and could be considered like the innovation Kickstarter that stable coins were to DeFi, this is to e-commerce. So like, why is that, why has that been so hard to solve for? And why is it so important in the context of e-commerce, but then maybe even extending into things around like the metaverse and virtual environments? So that core, um, what we call our core exchange mechanism is this commitment bridge between the digital and, and, and physical worlds. Um, and so what we actually, what we don't do, we do not tokenize real world items actually. We tokenize a commitment between a buyer and a seller to perform a transaction, to perform this exchange. Uh, and so we, we are a type of, a type of futures contract. Um, and so in the same way that futures contracts can then be kind of re represented digitally and sort of bundled into, into, into other products, um, that's what that's what Boson enables, and it enables that in a composable way. So every time you have some sort of application that you want to, uh, you know, create a digital to physical redemption, you don't need to solve for that. You don't need to to build that complex piece of technology. You can just plug into Boson in, as as almost a an oracle to the to the the physical the world of physical assets. 
Yeah, and I guess if you subscribe to the inevitability of DeFi because of that competition max um, principle, and you begin to understand that commitment tokens and thing tokens then become a new form of like real world or you know true truly valuable assets in the context of DeFi for the first time actually you've got things that mean something to real people in the real world being used in DeFi rather than just you know people speculating on any given token or stable coin my view on DeFi is that the infrastructure that underpins DeFi is the thing and the financial part is the first um, instance of its use. Um, so that, that's part of it, but also the fact that this infrastructure is just natively infused with, with finance as well is, is the other key thing. But um, we've seen with what Ocean Protocol are doing with data Using using DeFi infrastructure and and, and infusing finance with, with with data, and now um, building on that, what what we at Boson Protocol are doing with things, I think I think it, you know DeFi infrastructure will, will be the infrastructure upon which the, the Web three is built. So let's talk about go to market. I know that um, there are a number of SDKs that you've got, and then there are a handful of you know, first applications that you're kind of seeding and populating this e-commerce stack with. Can you talk us through how, how you're rolling those out? Um, so we, we have a, a thought out but quite dynamic go-to-market. So the way that that looks um, at the moment is our, our first um, uh, SDK that we will be launching uh, will be <clears throat> um, an SDK called Metamol, which quite simply enables brands to, or, or anyone in fact, to, to be able to sell a real world item in a virtual in-game or, or in-world um, at one of our Metamol stores where you'll go and you'll buy a Boson NFT, which you, which you, you, you can purchase in-game in-world, and then redeem that in-store um, you know, for the, the, the physical item. Um, so that, that, that's, that's the, the first release. Um, fast following that will then be a, um, an, an SDK that will enable um, NFT artists and, and marketplaces to, uh, to purchase a, a Boson commitment token NFT for a, a, a physical twin of a, of a piece of art and also um, for uh, gamers to be able to buy a, a Boson commitment token for uh, as an in-game item for a, fi a physical product or service. Um, so those are the, the first sort of series of, of, of Boson SDKs. Um, and then follow, following on from that is a, a DeFi SDK where we, we are partnering with a number of, of DeFi protocols where their users will be able to buy real-world items or exchange digital value for real world items within the protocol with no intermediaries without touching fiat. And so that, that's the sort of sequence of, of Boson SDKs. We're also working um, closely to support a number of more Web 2.5 applications and, and, and thicker applications, one being Nifty Key, which is a, a crypto native rewards and loyalty program, which enables um, crypto exchanges, crypto credit cards, loyalty programs to buy Boson um, NFTs to reward and plug into their, into their propositions, enabling their customers to redeem NFTs for real world items. And I noticed this other thing, which I imagine is an extension of um, maybe Metamol, but this idea of a, um, a metaverse bazaar. So the idea that it's not just purely for digital to physical redemption. There is this idea that you can allow for the redemption or exchange of digital things without the permission of a platform itself, right? For example, a gaming environment. Absolutely. So um, 
Boson protocol enables this this sort of trust minimized e exchange um, without the need for an intermediary. Um, and 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 the meta perverse bazaar is 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 simply that that could be a physical, digital, or on-chain thing that you know an assortment of different items and and enabling that trust minimized exchange within world or from you know metaverse to universe. It should be irrelevant, you know, where you're buying from too. You sh should still have the same sort of trust assurances and a very, very kind of slick user experience to go and just buy things without thinking about it. And of course, you can't totally remove risk from the system through the mechanism or anything else, but there are layers of innovations that you can put on top, right? So let's say something goes wrong. Let's say the core exchange mechanism can't totally solve for an exchange. What, what can then happen? And what's the future roadmap for the additional layers that you can build on top of managing risk? Sure. So, I mean, we're, we're building bows on uh, almost like a sort of an onion skin type approach. So there's the, the core mechanism, um, which um, we, you know, we, we've discussed of, of, of this core exchange mechanism that automates the, the management of, of that exchange. But if, if then um, a buyer, say, wants a, a refund or a, a return, that exchange mechanism, um, they can request one, and if the seller agrees, then that exchange mechanism can reverse, and you know the item can be refunded, um, and it, using the, the core mechanism. But there are always going to be situations where the buyer or seller, are, you know, are not satisfied with the outcome. In which case, there is an option to perform escalated arbitration to human arbitrators. Um, and again, that's that's another module. Um, and how we then how we then cover the cost of that? Uh, for, we, we we leverage some sort of DeFi mechanisms where we, for example, will assess the risk of the buyer and the seller, and then mutualize that cost. So it's it's a, it's, it's like a DeFi insurance um, mechanism. And and of course, you know, all of these things are are entirely possible in e-commerce and they're entirely possible in d-commerce. The beauty of d-commerce is as you unbundle these these services, you are reducing this, you're reducing the, the power of one single centralized intermediary to control all those levers and then exercise market power. We're distributing those services and decentralizing the control. And so this, the de-commerce stack, like integral to the de-commerce stack, like the DeFi stack, is that it is an ecosystem. It's composable. Um, any one module is interchangeable. Um, and therefore, you know, even Boson can't monopolize that system. So can you just talk through the plans about how you're going to grow that ecosystem? Sure. Yeah, I think that, I mean, to start, there are two things. One is... I don't think it's possible for one single entity to solve this the, 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 the scale of, of, of design challenges that are there. And two, it's not our intention to replace a centralized well with a decentralized well. So whilst we focus on, on the core and, um, and, and some also some core components, um, outside of that, there is, a, there is a whole range of different problems that need solving. And our approach is we are... Um, for example, doing a collaboration with the token engineering community and Gitcoin to fuse Web3 developers, token engineers, and, and, and technologists with e-commerce devs and, and, and technologists. Um, by bringing, bringing these two sets of, of people together through hackathons and, and working groups, etc., to first discover what are the problems. So there are some obvious ones, for example, connectors into shop, Shopify, on and off ramping, connectors into point of sale systems, you know, identity, all of these different elements are, are, all, are all pretty obvious. But there will be some that we, we, just, we just haven't foreseen that these smart minds getting together will see. And that, so the first part there is the discovery and then providing through the, the boson and d-commerce um, DAO structure that we have um, providing funding to then take these 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 um, concepts to the to the next stage, um, and then eventually um, for for a certain set of projects to actually fund them, including through conversations we've had with the Outlier Ventures Basecamp, having a, an accelerator track to fund e-commerce projects. 
Well, Justin, thanks for coming in to chat. Um, really looking forward to sharing with you on this decade plus long mission of making e-commerce mainstream. Thanks, Jamie, and thanks for yours and outlier support on this journey. I guess we'll go and burn our Alexis now, right? Exactly. <laughs> Great, love it. Awesome. Cheers. That's it. Do you want to retake any of that or yeah? Um, no, I was talking